Hey everybody, uh, I'm happy to welcome you to our webinar today. Um, I'm Andy Zimmerman, I'm the Chief Technology Officer here at Grace Technologies, and I'm super excited to be presenting on kind of a new topic for us, but one that's been near and dear to my heart over the last kind of decade plus, um, and one that certainly is exciting right now, uh, given kind of the state of technology over the last kind of six to 12 months, um, and that is navigating the artificial intelligence revolution, uh, specifically with respect to industrial predictive maintenance. Um, so before before actually I kick in, let me just touch on a couple of things. First and for, foremost, at any time, uh, I wanna encourage you to ask questions via the chat interface. We're not gonna answer those live during the, the actual presentation, but at the end, you know, I hope to have some, some good set of time to, uh, to address those questions as they come in. Additionally, uh, because of the, the kind of wealth of content that, that got developed for this webinar, Nick and I decided to split this into two sessions. So we'll be presenting part two of this webinar on Thursday. Um, and after that, we'll be sending out an on-demand copy of, of kind of the two parts uh, put together. Um, so with that, I think, I think that's all the, the housekeeping. Um, I'll, I'll kick off here. All right. So just a little bit of background about who I am. Um, again, my name is Andy Zimmerman. Uh, my background actually comes from a kind of strange place. I did my, my PhD at the University of Michigan uh, studying in civil and environmental engineering. And I was, I was building kind of artificially intelligent wireless sensor systems that were designed to monitor civil infrastructure. So bridges, ships, wind turbines, that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, that thesis work was all focused on distributing data processing tasks throughout those wireless sensor networks. And I moved from there, I started a company back in 2009 um, to really take that technology and focus it commercially on structural health monitoring and predictive maintenance or, or IIoT kind of technologies. So that company, Civionics, uh, I sold in 2018 to Grace Technologies um, and through kind of a complicated uh, thing I'm not going to explain, uh, we created a subsidiary called Perceive. So I'm super excited today to be able to put on the Perceive hat and really talk about a lot of the work we've done over the last four years building AI and kind of software-based analytics that sit behind our GraceSense line of technologies at, at Grace Technologies. All right, so uh, before I get going, I really do also wanna call out to my collaborators in the AI space. Over the last four years or so, I've collaborated heavily with uh, Iowa State University and Dr. Chow Hu, who's pictured here. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work developing algorithms to predict bearing failure um, in rotating equipment. And you can see here that we've we've had funding from, from the state of Iowa, from, from Grace Technologies, and then most recently from the National Science Foundation. That's really funded a lot of our, our comprehensive research in, in this space. So I'm not going to get into a lot of the details of that grant work here in this presentation, but um, I just want to set the stage for, for some of the background for why we're talking about this today. All right. So why, why is this webinar happening today and, and why is now the right time to have this particular discussion? Well, first and foremost, AI is an incredibly significant topic right now. Uh, both artificial intelligence and machine learning are really poised to transform the entire landscape of predictive maintenance. Um, and you know, ultimately, what we're talking about when we're doing that is drastically reducing downtime and kind of alongside that, reducing our overall cost of, of maintaining assets in the industrial world. The rate of rapid technological advance over the last kind of four or five years has, has been incredible. And that pace of innovation in both AI and ML is, is kind of constantly accelerating with new applications and new kind of technologies emerging, you know, almost every day. So again, now now is kind of the time to, to have these discussions. On the backside of those new kind of opportunities that are arising, we're also seeing new challenges. Um, as industries kind of start to incorporate AI and ML into the way they work, these challenges are going to present new hurdles that we need to figure out how to, to kind of navigate around. So things like how do we manage data? How do we deal with the implementation costs and management of AI and ML systems? Um, and then how do we keep the data that we're now collecting and the, the analytics that we're now providing private um, in kind of a cyber secure way? And really, lastly, the future is now. I mean, if you've seen any newspaper over the last six months, AI is is all over the place. Um, it's becoming uh, really prevalent in the commercial sector, and certainly industry is kind of poised, specifically in the predictive maintenance space, to take advantage a lot of a lot of these new AI and ML technologies. 
So before I get going, just some some brief expectations for, for what I expect to get out of this, this next kind of 30 to 45 minutes. Um, I'm expecting that most of you watching this webinar are coming to this from the perspective of industrial maintenance. So you're you're not an AI expert. You're coming from the, the kind of more industrial perspective. You see the potential of how AI can transform the way that you do business and the way that you maintain your assets, but you still have some questions about how artificial intelligence can really play within your existing ecosystem and, and how best to use these new technologies uh, to benefit your business. So what you can expect from this webinar and from me, first and foremost, this is a huge topic. Um, there's, as I mentioned before, we really found we can't cover it in a single webinar, so we're gonna spread it out over, over two parts. Um, and really my, my attempt is to provide a comprehensive overview of the topic. We're not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail on any one thing, um, so I'm going to I'm going to kind of position this as an AI ML um, in predictive maintenance 101 class. Um, I'm really not targeting AI experts here. Uh, again, I'm I'm going to try to keep this very surface level, uh, very easy to to interface with for for people who who don't necessarily yeah know the the nuts and bolts of what's happening under under the surface. Um, and I'm also not going to be product focused here. Uh, we'll do a little demo at the end of this first part um, of some neat stuff that I think we've been working on over the last uh, six weeks uh, or so. But but uh, in general, um, you know, this is just an informative webinar. Uh, hopefully I can give you some good content here to help you navigate artificial intelligence in this industrial space. All right. So there's not a lot to the two part webinar in terms of subsections, but I'll start by focusing on maintenance as a whole and how that's evolved and then talk about how artificial intelligence and machine learning can jump into that maintenance space and, and make a, a big difference. We're then going to talk about a new product offering we're getting ready to release um, called Foreman XAI. That'll be a, a brief demo kind of at the end of this part. And then on Thursday, we'll dive in in a little bit more detail and talk about AI concepts in a little bit more depth. Um, and then get to the, the back end of that webinar and talk about specifically some challenges and some opportunities that are presented by this, this, this wealth of technology that's been emerging over the last couple of years. So with that, let's, uh, let's jump into the evolution of maintenance. So from day one, uh, when we started maintaining our industrial assets, we're, we're really trying to do a real simple task, right? We're trying to keep our factories running. And in order to do that, we, we follow a pretty simple formula. First and foremost, we need to find out when things go wrong. And then when we find that out, we need to fix, fix the problem. And ultimately we're looking in the industrial maintenance space to keep that particular problem from happening again. So regardless of our approach, uh, that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. And the goal over the last you know, 40, 50 years is to make that process more efficient. Right? Can we identify problems faster? Can we fix problems more easily or more inexpensively or more quickly? Um, and can we eliminate downtime entirely? Right? If we can do all those things, we're sitting in a really good place. And I've kind of broken this down. You may have seen me talk about what we call the maintenance spectrum um, before, but I've really broken down today's discussion into these four topics where we start with corrective maintenance, we then move into a preventative space, bring that into a condition-based monitoring kind of ecosystem, and then and then move that into the predictive space, which is really the, the core of what we're gonna be talking about today. So um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about these, these four, four things before we pivot and really dive into the AI content. So to start with, corrective maintenance. This is your most basic type of maintenance in the industrial facility. Oftentimes we call this reactive or breakdown maintenance or run to failure type maintenance. And this generally is just involves, it, it, it involves letting something run to failure and then fixing it when it, when it, when it fails. Um, this is a, a good approach in a lot of cases. Still, even today with all the AI we have, it, it can be used when equipment failure really doesn't provide a significant impact on your on your business, um, or it doesn't lead to any sort of secondary failure once that that piece of equipment goes down. Um, and we typically apply it to to non critical assets. So the, the big example here would be I don't know a lot of folks who have condition monitoring or predictive maintenance technologies sitting on their their light bulbs. Right when we change a light bulb, we just wait for it to go out. We put a new one in. So this has some advantages. Um, number one, it's inexpensive to implement. 
Um, there's no upfront costs really, um, as you only take action when something bad happens. It's suitable for equipment that has unpredictable failures because we kind of just wait for something to fail and then and then we fix it. Um, from a kind of infrastructural perspective, it doesn't take much planning to implement a corrective maintenance program um, compared to a preventative or a predictive maintenance system. But on the downside of that, there's the potential for high costs. Um, you know, a lot of times if we have unplanned downtime, uh, that can really drive up uh, a facility's costs. Um, if we have to bring in labor urgently to fix something, that's more expensive than planning it out in advance. And then obviously, if you have a failure that you're not expecting and it causes something else to fail as well, that cost of replacing or repairing the equipment that's gone down can, can skyrocket. So um, we really, with this approach, have an have a, a increased risk of, of, of problems. So generally, the next step in the maintenance paradigm is to move on to a, a more preventative maintenance approach. So this is often talked about as schedule-based or planned maintenance, and it typically is going to involve some sort of routine inspection of your equipment, coupled with some sort of manufacturer's guidelines on how often something should be maintained. Um, and the idea is that this, this regular cadenced maintenance structure will give us the ability to prevent failures before they occur. So this is often used on assets where we really well understand the failure mechanism of that asset um, and we can anticipate kind of how things are going to degrade. It's really well positioned for critical assets where, you know, failure can lead to high downtimes, high disruption, high costs, uh, because the idea here is we're, we're getting out in front of the failure and we're fixing things before they go wrong. The, the big example, both at home and in the industrial space, is just changing oil. Uh, regularly in order to prevent engine wear, right? We, we do that on some sort of schedule that's set in combination of what the manufacturer rep recommends and, and how hard you're running the piece of equipment in which you're, you're changing oil. So the advantages of this sort of approach is that it does reduce the likelihood that you're going to see unplanned downtime. If we're maintaining ahead of time, we're, we're generally not seeing unexpected failures, or at least that's, that's the hope. It will extend your equipment's lifetime because we're not running that equipment in a degraded state. We're typically uh, in a healthy state because of that routine maintenance. It also allows a facility to really do a good job of budgeting their maintenance dollars. Um, their costs are predictable. Um, it allows us to do an advanced kind of budget assessment and it, it keeps the, the dollars and cents in a little bit more formulaic manner. On the flip side of that though, it can lead to unnecessary maintenance. If I'm maintaining something once a month and not using that asset as frequently as maybe we used to, we're probably over maintaining that uh, because it's just based on kind of average use and expected life cycles. It really does also require a good understanding of the equipment itself and, and how that equipment runs um, in order to effectively schedule out um, the, the, the cadence for maintenance. And lastly, this can be pretty resource intensive because it requires both planning and it requires the actual laborer to go out and do these routine inspections and, and, and perform maintenance on a, on a regular cadence. So over the last kind of decade where the industry has really been pushing towards is, is implementing sensors to get us to a phase where we're using what we call condition-based maintenance approaches, right? This is where we take those sensors, we monitor our equipment, we grab data from that equipment that can be indicative of of problems that might occur during normal operation. And then we we use that data to detect problems before failure occurs in our in our asset that we're trying to monitor. We generally see condition monitoring used on very critical assets or complex machinery that has kind of a regular operating condition. So it's running in more or less the same way generally. Um, and we know more or less how the piece of equipment is is prone to failure. So this is especially effective in places where that downtime of that equipment can can lead to significant costs. And the reason it's effective there is because this is a more expensive approach to maintenance than than kind of just doing a preventative or a, 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 a wait till it fails kind of uh, approach. So the good example here, and we at Grace, you know, sell products in this space is using vibration. Uh, monitoring devices or sensors to detect the onset of bearing damage, right? We can use increases in the amount of vibration that we're seeing and the way that that vibration is happening to drive early maintenance that, that prevents the actual downtime of, of the piece of rotating equipment. So condition-based maintenance has a lot of advantages. It, as I've mentioned, drastically can reduce your unplanned downtime. 
It allows us to schedule maintenance work ahead of time because we're using kind of a data-driven approach to when things need to happen. And generally, this is going to increase the overall lifespan of our equipment because we're, we're detecting issues earlier and therefore the repairs or the maintenance um, is, is, is done in such a way that we're not running a piece of equipment in a damaged state generally. However, on the flip side of that, this is typically something that requires investment, um, both in specialized tools and in technology and in training, right? In order to effectively implement a condition-based monitoring solution, we need expertise in data analysis and uh, data interpretation. Um, and all of this becomes, you know, can be expensive and hard, hard to maintain, right? So it does require constant attention and maintenance, but it sets the stage nicely. This condition-based monitoring paradigm or what we're talking about with the rest of this presentation, which is, is truly predictive maintenance. So the question that I'm gonna phrase in this particular slide is how can AI impact the maintenance world that, that we just discussed? And you know, it can do this in kind of a variety of ways. First and foremost, I think AI is really the stepping stone through which we can get to a true predictive maintenance world. Um, a lot of folks talk about predictive maintenance when they're talking about condition-based maintenance, but really when we're predicting something, we're, we're, we're truly looking into the future and trying to see when a particular asset is going to fail, right? So what AI can do is it can come in, it can help analyze patterns in data and help predict failures, hopefully long before they occur. So whereas condition-based maintenance is really looking at when that data exceeds some threshold, the predictive piece is going to say, hey, I know when that data is going to exceed that threshold. And, and that's at some point in the future. So we're getting an additional uh, lead time before we need to go in and maintain that, that piece of equipment. Um, this also uh, allows AI to come in and use historical and real-time data together to suggest possible remediation actions when something does go wrong. So we can leverage that artificial intelligence as a sort of co-pilot to aid in our, our preventative measures, both before an incident occurs and then, and then once the, the, the failure or the equipment degradation has happened. It helps us to efficiently or potentially optimally allocate our resources. So that artificial intelligence can come alongside kind of the maintenance team and help prioritize maintenance tasks based on urgency and importance in a way that will lead to hopefully an optimal allocation of resource um, in, the, in the facility and uh, you know, an ultimate cost effectiveness of, of the maintenance program. And then lastly, and this is, this is pretty important, almost every customer we talk to has a difficulty hiring and, and keeping personnel that are both experienced and, and skilled in the, in the maintenance workforce. And there's a lot of kind of reasons for this, but we generally find that most industrial customers of ours right now are short staffed and that, that staff may be undertrained or, or at least under experienced. And so I think that one thing that artificial intelligence can do for the predictive maintenance space or maintenance in general is provide a true intelligent partner that can assist that, that maintenance workforce in that, that, that may be lacking personnel and experience and assist that workforce in, in, in maintaining the equipment that exists um, in really any industrial facility. So uh, from there, let's talk about, you know, this topic of AI, what is artificial intelligence? And there's a lot of ways that we can define this, but I'm gonna just kind of very simply lay this out as artificial intelligence is always gonna come from a computing system of some sort. And it's going to be capable of learning from data, it's gonna be capable of you know, taking that data and then making decisions. And ultimately we're, we're using it to perform tasks that generally, at least historically speaking, have required a, a human level intelligence to perform. Right, so at a, at a high level, we're, we're, we're using a computer to do something that um, that previously was impossible without a, a human in the loop, right? There's a lot of applications here, and we're gonna talk about these later, so I won't touch on them, but but, but generally predicting maintenance or machinery failure, um, recommending maintenance tasks, interpreting images, all these things, this all falls into the, the, the big bucket of artificial intelligence in the, the maintenance space. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do now, we're going to lay out a handful of artificial intelligence applications that apply to the predictive maintenance space. And we'll just walk through each one of those and I'll give you a little bit of color on, on the, the sorts of things that AI is well positioned to, to do over the next few years um, in, in really any industrial facility. We'll start with image recognition or, or computer vision. So 
image recognition is generally a subset of, of what we call computer vision. It's a technology that's going to come in and help identify people, places, objects, uh, possibly writing, other things that exist in images. And that image could be either a still image, a photograph, or, or video. So this involves processing and interpreting that visual data, and then we take that data and categorize and label what what we find in that in that data. So you know the the, the big example that that I see uh, that you may have have seen kind of in the main media is when you look at a self driving car, you see a lot of times that we've we've got these boxes surrounding objects that that car is passing, and that's that's the AI identifying that object and then classifying it as a a human or a, a dog or another car, right? So the capabilities that are key to image recognition, uh, first and foremost, identifying the presence and the location of objects within an image, right? That's the drawing of the box. We can classify those images. So we can take that, that image, break it into pieces, and then classify parts of it or the whole thing into certain categories. So is this a picture of a bird? Is this a picture of a plane? Is this a picture of Superman, right? Um, so uh, facial recognition is another big topic um, uh, in, in, in the use case for image recognition where we're able to identify and or verify um, a person's identity just using their facial features. Um, lastly, we can leverage image recognition um, to take text, um, an image of text, either, either written or uh, typed, um, and then identify uh, the characters that are on there from from either an image or a scan document of of that text and when we bring all this together um, we can do a lot of kind of really advanced things so that the, the common example of this ai and kind of everyday use cases is facebook or any one of the social media platforms taking a photograph and then automatically tagging who exists in that photograph we've all seen that technology play out uh, quite a bit um, uh, in in kind of our day-to-day -day lives but then when we move that into the industrial facility, we see that there's tremendous application for this AI there as well. So first and foremost, we can use a similar facial recognition to, uh, to aid our kind of security measures. So we'll either in surveillance or potentially using facial recognition to enable access to certain parts of a facility that may be otherwise off limits um, to, to the general populace. We can use image recognition in the kind of AGV or autonomous vehicle space to identify objects, signs, lanes, just to increase the navig nav navigability um, and safety of those autonomous vehicles. We can use AI in the image recognition world to visually inspect assets. So this would be using either video or still images to search for signs of damage or decay in um, in our our, our industrial uh, equipment, and then lastly, and this is kind of related to the last one, we can we can use this to augment some existing technologies. So um, thermal imaging is typically used to to uh, detect pre the presence of heat um, in some sort of rotating or electrical equipment, and and that thermal imaging can be coupled with image recognition to actually pull out um, signs of impending failure in in pieces of equipment that could that could potentially overheat. So that's just kind of an, an overview of how image recognition can impact the predictive maintenance space. So we'll, oh, I got one more, um, drone inspections. So this is again, coupled with this idea of doing a visual inspection using an artificially intelligent partner. Here we can put a drone, either um, you know a, a flying drone or potentially a robot that's ground-based into potentially dangerous areas to do inspections for us and use the AI to kind of automate some of that analysis of the imagery that's coming back from that drone. All right, so the second application that I'm gonna talk about is predictive analytics. And again, this is a big space. This can encompass a lot of things, but in general, what we're talking about is leveraging either statistical techniques or full machine learning approaches um, to analyze both current and historical data in order to predict future outcomes, right? So the idea is that they, these technologies are going to aid us in understanding both kind of what's happened in the past and then using that understanding to predict what most likely is going to happen in the future. And obviously that, that creates tremendous value for how we maintain our facilities. Predictive analytics from a key capability perspective, forecasting is the big thing, right? That's predicting a trend over time. 
Um, now, if this worked perfectly, you know, we'd all make a lot of money on the stock market. Um, unfortunately, not all data trends can be predicted, but fortunately in the predictive maintenance space, we can we can leverage forecasting in a lot of ways to look at where data is headed and when it's going to create a, a situation that requires maintenance. We also uh, leverage predictive analytics to do classification. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but basically we're taking we're taking data and then we're predicting the category to which a certain data point belongs, whether that's an image or a, a, a sensor trend. Uh, we want to do uh, we, uh, risk assessment in general with um, predictive analytics, and that's tying all this together to estimate the likelihood of a given outcome, right? If we can forecast into the future different possible uh, scenarios and then assign probabilities to those scenarios, we can leverage that to kind of do a, a risk forecast for how important it is that we do certain maintenance at, at, at different times. And then ultimately what we're looking to do with predictive analytics is optimize decision making uh, based on the different data sources that are coming into uh, the, the predictive analytics engine. So the common example of this uh, that you've seen in your everyday life is, is through Netflix or any sort of streaming service that's going to use your pre-existing behavior to predict what kind of things you might want to view in the future. Right, so whether that's what what things you've bought, it's going to predict what sort of things you might want to buy, or what things you've watched or listened to. It, uh, we can leverage these algorithms to kind of give suggestions for what an individual might be interested in seeing or viewing or uh, listening to in in the future. In the predictive maintenance space, this has a lot of applications. We can use predictive analytics to establish a baseline, kind of a standard operating uh, behavior of a piece of machinery and then use that baseline to issue alerts when we see anomalous behavior happen, right? So this is an important thing for uh, detecting anomalies and engaging a maintenance team early. We can do remaining useful life prediction. We can take data and predict how long a piece of equipment has until it starts to fail based on historical data. And then ultimately, I talked about this on the last slide, we can use that information to do a risk assessment and associate a given risk with different types of failure which then allows us to prioritize what we do on the maintenance side based on those, those risk uh, profiles. All right, so let's move on to some of the, the, the more kind of novel recent AI technologies. And I'll start with natural language processing. Uh, this is a branch of AI that's gonna give a machine the ability to read, understand, interpret, and derive meaning from human language, right? So this takes, ideas from computational linguistics and then couples it with machine learning or deep learning techniques to, to give this sort of uh, ability for a machine to understand what a human is saying. This is used in a variety of ways. First one is sentiment analysis. That's looking at a piece of text or a, a, a portion of speech and determining kind of what the person means by that. So an example would be, uh, is, the, is this tweet a positive or negative reaction to some event? Right, so sentiment analysis allows us to extract subjective information from source materials. We can classify text into different organized groups and that, that plays out in a lot of different ways. We can do machine translation, right? That's your interpreter when you take uh, English and you, you convert to French and then from French to Spanish, that's an understanding of either written or uh, typed text um, and then bringing that from one language to another. And lastly, speech recognition, that, that adds the, the written or typed uh, capabilities and brings in the ability to interpret spoken language as well. All right, so the common example here that you've all interfaced with is the digital assistant, right? Whether that's Siri or Alexa or the Google Assistant, these are all using natural language processing to both understand and then set the stage for responding to voice commands. In the, in the uh, predictive maintenance space, we can use this sort of uh, natural language processing to read and interpret things like maintenance logs, uh, maintenance records, we can identify patterns that come out of those and alert to potential issues based on anomalous behavior in that text. Uh, we can use this to set the stage for intelligent assistance, right? These are, think of them as chatbots, and this is uh, the technology that enables us to build those chatbots in a way that it's going to understand what we say or what we type um, and interpret those, those kind of commands um, in a way that, that allow us to, to automate some of the, the feedback that we give a, a given user. And lastly, we, we can really benefit from natural language processing in the training and safety world by uh, 
taking safety protocols and training manuals um, and then allowing the natural language processing to create kind of an interactive environment for training an individual. And I'll talk about this a little bit more um, in the next application, which ties really tightly to natural language processing. And that's that's generative AI. This is the one that you've heard about probably uh, over the last six months in, in great detail. This is where we're taking systems um, AI-based systems that are capable of generating new creative content or new data that matches the patterns of some sort of input data that we're providing it, right? And this gives the artificially intelligent agent the ability to create things like image or text or music or any sort of other form of creative output in a way that that's authentic and original uh, at the same time uh, using the data set that we're training that, that system with. This allows us, again, to create content um, of a variety of different sorts. It lets us augment data. I'll talk about this on the next slide, but you know, the idea is we can take synthetic data um, that's made by the AI and use that to, to augment real-world data in cases where we don't have a lot of real-world data to, to go with or to use. And then lastly, uh, we can use this to simulate realistic scenarios uh, for both training and, and testing purposes. All right, so a common example of this, the big one over the last six months has been OpenAI's release of, of ChatGPT and the, the, the GPT models that sit behind it. Um, these have allowed uh, humans really to interface and create human-like text based on some sort of given prompt that, that you put in there. Um, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on that because I'm, I'm sure you've all seen this in, in action, but this sort of generative AI can, can have tremendous impact in the predictive maintenance space. And I'll talk about these kind of two or three different ways in which I see it impacting. Number one, synthetic data generation. I just talked about this on the last slide, but a lot of predictive maintenance requires a lot of failure data. And in the industrial world, sometimes it's hard to gather failure data. So if we can actually take um, the failure data that we have and then augment it with synthetic data, we can create predictive algorithms that are significantly more impactful. Um, we also can use generative AI to simulate different scenarios. So um, this is going to generate a creative scenario where a piece of equipment fails in a certain way and then help understand and train around potential issues uh, that might occur in the predictive maintenance environment. Um, we can also use generative AI to generate predictive models. So these are going to uh, kind of autonomously build out machine learning models that can do a better job of predicting equipment failure than the ones that, that came before. And then, you know, lastly here, we can generate additional normal machine data that can help detect anomalous behavior. So this is very similar to the synthetic data generation piece, but allows us to, to kind of pivot that and look for anomalous behavior in our, in our assets. The one that's not on here also is this is the natural extension of kind of that chatbot interface, right? Where we use natural language processing to interpret what the human is saying, and then we use a generative AI to, to position a response that sounds very human-like back to that human. Okay, I think this is my last application here, um, and that is digital twin. So you may have heard this, this kind of term uh, bandied around in a variety of different ways. Generally, we're talking about creating a virtual model of a, a process or a product or a service or something, and it's gonna serve as a mirror of that thing in the real world. And we use sensors on the real thing and data that comes from those to reflect the state of the real world in that, that kind of virtual environment. So this is kind of defined in a variety of ways. We can, we can use this for simulation and testing. Uh, we can model how a system may uh, respond under different conditions. Uh, without actually risking the real system, right? We could fail the virtual model without actually failing the, the physical asset. Um, we can optimize our performance. So we can analyze data patterns and then optimize how, uh, you, you know, you, you basically take the virtual thing and you do something to it and you use that, um, that, that feedback from what the virtual model tells you is gonna happen in order to optimize the actions we should take in the real world to, to, to the physical um, asset. And then from there, you know, this can all be used for training and learning, uh, where we um, build out technologies that allow folks to understand the entire system's workings without actually messing with the physical thing that you're training on. So the common example, and this isn't a perfect example for a digital twin, but it's it's fairly close. And that's that's of a flight simulator, where we offer in a digital environment a detailed and realistic view of, of what an aircraft 
will do um, and, and how it responds to the environment in which it operates, right? So pilots use these all the time um, to, to kind of train on how a real aircraft is gonna perform under a given, uh, a given uh, scenario, right? In a safe setting. So they're not, they're not actually in the aircraft at the time. In the predictive maintenance world, this digital twin concept can, can perform kind of a variety of tasks for us. Number one, it can give us a comprehensive view of the data that's coming from the machinery, right? So we can actually view in the digital environment how that, uh, that data interacts with, with the other assets around the, the thing that's being monitored and give us a, a view that lets us immediately respond to changes in that data or issues that arise uh, based on the data that we're, we're seeing. We um, uh, can also use digital twins for simulation and testing, uh, where we've got different scenarios that we build out in the in the digital or virtual world, um, and then use those to foresee potential issues um, in in the real world uh, and evaluate kind of different strategies for what we should do if we see that scenario pop up in 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 the real world. And lastly, you know, you bring all this together. The idea is to optimize how we use our equipment using this virtual model to kind of perturbate and, and create like some, some scenarios that we can analyze and, and make decisions based on. All right, so if I'm right, yep. The, the kind of last part of this discussion, and I do have a few minutes left here to do this. Um, uh, we're gonna do a quick demo that just demonstrates one, one slice of what we've been talking about. I'm excited to kind of do this demonstration because it's, a, it's kind of a new technology that we've been working on um, and we we are definitely looking for folks who are interested in what I'm about to present uh, and want to kind of get their hands dirty. Uh, we're looking for some early adopters of this technology to just come in for free and and start playing around with what, what we're going to offer. So Nick's going to put a, a poll up on the screen just to to uh, see if 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 you have interest in in what I'm showing. Um, and we'll reach reach out to you uh, kind of in the in the coming days um, with with early access um, to this this Foreman uh, AI. Uh, uh, technology. So before I get into that, I just want to kind of click through what it is we're doing inside Perceive. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to focus the demo on one slice of this. But in general, what we're trying to do is help you collect data. That's the gray sense line of technology. We have wireless sensors. We have capability to grab data out of PLCs and SCADA, you know, that that sort of thing. We want to be able to analyze that data in meaningful ways. So we we do that a lot in the vibration space. We bring vibration data out of the sensors, and then we we interpret that to give kind of identification of things that might be wrong in your facility based on the data that we're we're capturing. Um, we I mentioned this really early in the presentation. We do have some predictive models that we built with with university partners um, that actually take that data and allow us to predict uh, bearing failure. For example, these aren't ready to go live yet, but that's that's one of the pieces that we've been working on. And then what I'm going to be talking about today is actually helping you maintain your assets through the use of a, a form and explainable AI um, chat interface, which will give real time maintenance help to a, a maintenance personnel. And then, you know, at the end of this, I, I'll, I'll get into this a lot more on Thursday, but we really want to be able to bring explainable artificial intelligence technologies to the industrial space. And this is going to allow um, you know, you as, as an end user of AI to, to better trust the underlying AI that, that you're using in your facility. So with that, I'm going to switch over and actually do a, a live demo, um, which is somewhat terrifying. Um, if you've ever done a live demo, uh, these things have a tendency to, uh, you know, go off the rails, but we're going to, we're going to see how this works. So um, what you're looking at now is just our standard Foreman uh, XAI interface for the, the maintenance-based chat. Um, and what I'm going to do here today is just show you really quickly how how easy it would be to get a maintenance kind of assistant up and running. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new asset here. This is going to be a let's just call it a, you know, a, a pump two. <laughs> um, and I'm going to come in here and grab grab a pump um, uh, type of uh, kind of make and model that we're going to associate with that asset, right? So I've I've defined out the asset that we're we're, we're talking about, and then. A, a, the the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually give the AI a little bit more information than it has to start with in terms of how to maintain this asset. So if you've used ChatGPT, I mean, you could jump into that interface and start asking maintenance questions and it would give you very generalized answers. But what we've kind of enabled here is the ability to create a chat. Um, I'll call this just the webinar chat. And we're going to, you know, chat about that new pump that I just created. Um, and 
we're going to say, hey, AI, I've actually got a, um, a, 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 a kind of a, a manual for that piece of equipment that I wanna give you to augment your ability to kind of make decisions um, and, and give us some meaningful feedback from the, the queries that we're answering, right? So at that point, I've kind of loaded up the chat. It's ready to, to be able to, to give us some, some valid data. I've got this document loaded over here, um, this, this kind of bearing guide, which I'll pop up on the screen. Um, and I'm, just, I'm gonna say, let's say we have a problem, right? So uh, my, my pump, is running whoop, at 1800 RPM and I'm seeing increased vibration at, um, you know, at let's say at 3600 RPM. So 2X the shaft speed, right? Um, what is wrong? Okay, so one thing you'll note about any sort of generative AI, let me just make sure we're, uh, is that it does take a while for that AI to return. So instead of kind of sitting here and, and, and doing this all live, I'm just going to bounce to a very similar chat we had kind of earlier um, around a, a similar asset. So here's a very similar query we gave this. My pump's running at 1800 RPM. We've got an elevated radial vibration at 130, 38 hertz. You know, what are the possible causes here? Right. So our foreman AI is responding and saying, well, you know, here's some steps to address, you know, that potential issue and gives us a list of possible problems here. And these are all kind of coming from its general intelligence, but then being augmented by a um, uh, the AI that's kind of sitting sitting behind uh, uh, the document that we've uploaded. Um, so if I can get this to come up, here we go. It's going to spin here to. Um, to check out, let's say we're, we're interested in, uh, we, we think that maybe we've failed to effectively lubricate uh, this particular pump. I can jump to the point in the guide that's actually going to kind of give me further information about that. And in this case, in this demo, we came down and we said, you know what, I think this is a lubrication issue, right? But how do I know for sure that it's a lubrication issue? And the AI then gives a set of steps that's going to allow us to kind of jump into that and uh, assess whether that lubrication issue is is actually um, the issue, right? So check the lubricant type, uh, look at the system, uh, look at the levels. I mean, in all cases, it's going to give us some citations back to that document um, that, that are going to allow us to, to kind of dig into that manual in, in greater detail. So, you know, just to, to kind of burn through the rest of this. So we've we've done the maintenance, we see a potential blockage um, in the oil return hole. And then we say, you know, I don't know how to fix this. What do I do? Well, the AI steps in and gives kind of a six step kind of guide. You're going to shut down the pump, access it, clean it, inspect it. Um, and then, you know, it, it asks the user, hey, did this did this fix it? Um, you know, what what tell us what happens when you do this, this these actions. The user checks back in. Okay, we follow these instructions. Um, our vibrations return to normal. Is there anything else we should check to make sure that we've actually repaired the problem? And the AI gives you know a handful of kind of feedback here. You know, you want to check the RPM of the pump. Um, give some examples of how to do that. You want to monitor the vibration again, um, and then inspect for any new abnormalities. So the user does that and says everything looks great. And the the kind of way that the AI exits in this case is is to give you a a total kind of um, uh, a root cause analysis of, of what just happened. So it gives you a review of the initial potential causes, uh, the primary causes that were identified out of the AI, and then um, some remediation steps uh, that, that are taken from there. So that, at a very general level, is an example of a technology where, where we're bringing a couple of AI concepts into one thing to give an artificially intelligent partner uh, to a maintenance technician. Um, so again, if any of you are interested in, um, uh, in you know, actually getting your hands dirty with this technology, we're offering some free early access. Um, click click on the poll here, or go to our website and, and kind of uh, reserve uh, and register for that early access there. Um, so I think at this point, Nick, um, I'm gonna just bounce my slide back up there so there's some content, um, or I mean, contact information to be shown, and then um, we'll open it up for questions. Go. All right. right. Okay. So yeah, if anyone has, I'm gonna do my best. This is we're we're getting used to using Teams as a platform, but please uh, please stick in your um, uh, questions into this webinar, and I will go through these and try to try to answer any questions that that pop up. 
Okay, all right, there's a good one here. Can AI be fed with old data in the system or is it only run using real-time information? Um, almost always, that AI is going to be most effective if you train it on historical data. So, um, you know, the, exa the, the, the best example of that is, is we're going to, we're going to have a, you know, years and years of information on some asset, and we're going to use that to train a model that understands how that asset behaves. And then we're going to feed it with data moving into the future and use that future data, looking back on that historical information to, to make assessments based on the health of that, that piece of equipment. Now that said, I know a lot of facilities we step into don't have historical data, right? So there's a couple of things we do there. Um, number one, if you're maintaining an asset, uh, let's say it's a, a blower, um, you know, your blower is is unique in, in almost every way, but we can leverage training data that's been captured at other sites or from potentially that, that blower manufacturer um, in order to, to give a baseline for which we can look for problems, right? And then you're going to take that real-time data moving into the future, feed it into the, the, the kind of predictive analytics and, and make assessments based on it. So ideally, you have all the data in the world. In in, in a common practice, you do, you have no data, and so you kind of potentially set up and do some baselining for the first couple of months, where you understand how a, how a piece of equipment works, and then you use that to drive the analytics from there. All right, um, Nick's mentioned that. Uh, I appreciate anyone who said that was a good demo. Um, I am very happy that the internet came back on and let me uh, let me proceed. Um, okay. So I, I'm I'm going to take a question about ROI. Um, you know, how do you know when the right time is to invest? And I'll, I'll talk about it from the condition-based monitoring and from the predictive maintenance perspective. Um, you know, how do you know when it's when you're going to see a, a, a return on an investment on this sort of technology? Um, you know, what we typically work on with our customers is a you really want to bite off a small piece before you try to instrument out your whole facility. So typically we work to find the most critical asset in a given facility, uh, the one that, you know, goes down once a month and causes, you know, three hours of downtime once a month, right? That that would be a good target for any sort of condition-based monitoring or predictive technology. Um, if you know the downtime cost of that three hours of downtime, let's say it costs you $10,000 an hour in uh, lost production, um, you know, at that point, the very first time we, you know, prevent one of those downtime incidents from happening, that's gonna you basically be $30,000 that you're not losing. So you build a return on investment case based on that. And then, you know, the idea is once that technology is in the facility, um, you start to find other applications where you can kind of build on uh, that technology and, and create additional value. Um, but, but in general, the biggest advice is, you know, find that most critical thing, get familiar with the technology while applying it to that and don't try to bite off too much because um, it is a lot to bring this sort of technology in. Um, oh, this is a good one. All right, what in my experience are AI's limitations? Um, you know, to, to be fair, that that opinion has changed a little bit over the last year. Um, I've, I've seen AI advance in ways I wasn't expecting faster than I expected. Um, but you know, if, if we look at the generative AI, the big limitation right now is folks expect that to, to be able to kind of have uh, a, a true rationalization about current events or facts when, you know, that that actual generative AI is what it's doing is it's just predicting the next best thing that it thinks a human is going to say. So there are some limitations in terms of folks understanding of how that generative AI is 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 working and how it's trained. Um, I think there's some limitations to these large language models. Um, they can only be trained using you know tremendous amounts of resource. Um, and and right now we're still working into how how that can be containerized on a smaller scale. Um, you know I think that there's some kind of resource issues with with both training and then executing these large language models on on a, a, a large scale um, in the Kind of remaining useful life predictive area um the biggest challenge that we've run into over the last four years is just lack of good solid failure data to work from um to give you an example my background actually comes out of using this sort of technology to to detect and predict failures in things like bridges 
right? And you can't just go like destroy a bridge and take data from the destruction of that bridge. So uh, that's true in the maintenance environment as well, where you, you you don't want things to fail. So it's sometimes hard to grab that information you need to build a really elegant model that lets you do good prediction. Um, so, so that data collection piece, um, that data exists, but it's kind of hard to get into a, a, a single space. Um, so that's a handful of random things, but uh, hopefully that kind of covered that. Um, ah. Uh, when do you question the answer that AI gives you? Um, I mean, I tend to <laughs> I tend to question the answer that anybody gives me all the time. Um, I mean, even if I've got an expert in the room, I'm ultimately going to you know agree with the expert, but I'm I, I do not necessarily verbatim trust that I've provided all the information to that expert that they need to make an expert opinion. So that's true of AI as well. Um, you, know, you know, just out of the box. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna question um, whether the the answer that was given back is 100% accurate. Now the beauty of this generative AI revolution that's really happened over the last six months is that I can actually probe on that answer, um, and that's one of the reasons why we've gone down the explainability path. One of the reasons why we've incorporated the uh, the document based approach to this is that it gives the user some level of comfort that like this AI isn't just making stuff up. It's actually pulling this from this section of this document. Um, you know, and, and ultimately, if we can get to a point where the AI can explain itself in a way that a human would, um, I mean, I think the way I trust the AI is the same as the way I trust any other human in, in the way I interact. Um, all right. Are there, uh, there's a question about supply chain issues. Um, yeah. So AI has, I, I didn't talk about that today, but AI definitely has the potential to positively impact supply chain issues, um, both from predicting kind of uh, an optimal inventory level perspective, you know, looking at at, at demand um, over time and kind of trying to forecast where that's going to go, um, allowing us to be more proactive on the procurement side. Um, uh, let me just make sure I, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, that's basically the question that's being asked. If you can't get the parts, um, it would seem just as important as knowing when something's going to. Absolutely, that's 100% true, right? If you if you need if if you're predicting that something's going to go down and you need the, the you know the 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 bearing from manufacturer X, um, that's got a, a six month lead time. Well, you know that's that's something that an AI could pick out as a potential problem. Um, now our our technology isn't focused on that space, but but it's certainly a place where where AI could create a tremendous amount of value. Um, yeah, okay, next question's about uh, response time. Anyone who's interfa interfaced with ChatGPT knows, especially when it first launched, um, sometimes you couldn't even get in, sometimes it would take 30 seconds for a response to come back. And over the last really six months, that has become more or less um, uh, real time um, in a lot of ways. So uh, in terms of timeline for getting to a faster kind of delivery point, I think, that's just a matter of bringing the computational resources up uh, to where we can use them. One of the things that I think you're going to start to see is the distribution of these models onto separate computing systems. So instead of leveraging a big cloud where everybody is is grabbing information from the same point, you'll be able to deploy that model locally, and then you know your 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 demand on that model is only as high as as that inside your facility. So I think there's a variety of things that are happening to make that that response from one of these large generative AI models or large language models um, uh, quicker. Um, but it's not a space I work in directly, so I, I don't want to be too <laughs> too firm on that point. Um, yeah, okay, this is an awesome question. How about distributed AI versus centralized? Is it fe feasible to perform runtime machine learning performance at the device? So interesting you asked that question. That's one of the things uh, that we've done in this, in this research. We have a um, a low cost wireless compute platform, our, our vibration and temperature sensor. Um, and we actually have performed uh, both training and kind of execution of a machine learning model on that wireless sensor platform. So the, the, the benefit of that um, distributed approach to this is that it allows us to not necessarily transmit wirelessly in a battery powered environment, all of the information that's required to train a model. We can do that training and that assessment of data locally um, and then provide kind of predictions based on how long that asset has 
left <laughs> in remaining useful life um, kind of uh, we can we can provide just that out to the the end user um, and obviously that that would be a tremendous saving on wireless bandwidth and the amount of time that that node has to be on uh, which would give us the ability to do this in a battery powered package now that's not something that's ready for commercial use yet um, it's something we've been kind of working on more on the, the grant side but I do see the ability to perform distributed AI tasks as as a major advance in in a lot of cases where where there are battery driven constraints or you just have resource constraints in general with with the amount of compute power you you have access to um is your data public so i'm not 100 percent sure what that question means i'll talk about data publicity a little bit um let me see how i want to answer this so um at at grace we anything we do inside perceive or at grace that that data belongs to the the, the customer we have access with to it to help you know perform our analytics and and uh do the things that we do um but it certainly is not like customer data is not made public um and really the way that we build our ai models there's no path for that data to ever translate into um, somebody else's hands um uh yeah i i think you know there is data that that this generative AI world has raised a lot of data concerns where when I provide anything into the internet, all of a sudden it it, it generates out the other side as someone else's um, idea or someone else's uh, creation, right? Through the the, the ChatGPT or generative AI path. Um, that's something that, that there's no real good answer for yet. It's something that I think uh, will need to be looked at over the next few years in, in a real serious way. Um, can AI do an assessment at the design stage of the project? So um, I'm going to answer that in kind of a tangential way. I think both condition-based monitoring and the kind of AI techniques I've talked about have a tremendous potential to aid the design process, not just the maintenance process. Um, and the way that that typically works is, you know, if you have those data streams, um, it allows you to kind of loop back around with, with data that you get, feed that back into the design process and iterate your designs in a, in a more um, compelling way. So um, when we talk about kind of mechanical or um, uh, even electrical or civil design process where you're, CAD, you're using CAD to do something, um, absolutely. Uh, I know folks at Autodesk are looking at ways they can use AI to automate you know, some of the, the, the work that they're doing, um, you know, that could be done on the electrical CAD side, certainly in the development of software. I mean, we, we heavily, our software team here uses um, AI-based tools to augment our, our coding um, when, when we're, we're touching on that. So, so absolutely, um, you know, I think, I think there is a considerable amount of room to bring AI into the design process at the system level, at the, at the equipment level, you know, just across the spectrum in the, in the industrial maintenance space. Um, Uh, Nick, do you see anything here I missed? Uh, nope. Okay. The last uh, comment here was you answered a lot of my questions, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, this was very high level. I know I didn't get into any detail, but I think that that was in, intentional. Um, we would love to have some conversations. This is a, a new uh, a new thing. Um, and so if if you want to pop into the second part of the webinar on Thursday, I'd love to, to kind of see you there. We'll get into a little bit more detail. If you want to register for early access to kind of some of the technology that you just saw in this demo, please do. Um, you can also get to that registration link from the, the website on the page. Anything else I need to say, with Nick? Are we good? No, I think we're good. I will uh, send out a follow-up email to all the registrants. It'll include a link to part two as well. Um, an on-demand video will become available at a later date uh, for both of these webinars. Um, but yeah, thank you all for attending. We're also going to drop a link in um, the email after this uh, to sign up if you want for the early access to form an XAI um, in case you missed the poll today. But yeah, overall, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Andy. Yep. Thank you.